Great. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. And thank you, Selena, uh, for organizing tonight's event and inviting me to speak. My name is Ariadne Boutsakis. I'm the project coordinator for the Stewardship Center for BC's Cats and Brace program. And this evening, I'll be sharing insights into the impacts of free roaming cats on local bird populations, uh, the importance of addressing these impacts, and our work to support wildlife conservation and animal welfare across BC. Uh, before we begin, I just want to acknowledge that I am speaking to you from the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations, and recognizing that First Nations have been caring for these lands since time immemorial um, reminds us of the responsibility that we have to treat nature and animals, all living beings, uh, with respect and compassion. At SCBC, our mission is to strengthen ecological stewardship in BC by providing educational, technical, uh, and capacity programs and resources to various stakeholders, including governments, um, the private sector, and the public through collaborative partnerships. As the project coordinator, I've attended a number of community events this year to raise awareness about responsible cat ownership practices and the impact of roaming cats on wildlife. I've also had the opportunity to present to local councils like the Township of Langley and the City of Burnaby to advocate for policies that address the roaming cat issue at a local level. And at the Stewardship Centre for BC, um, we work with partners to make BC a safer place for both cats, birds and other wildlife. Um, so we work with several different stakeholders, including conservation and animal welfare organizations, academics, um, veterinary professionals and governments to implement collaborative outreach, resort, research and resource development. And through these collaborative efforts, our shared goals are to improve cat welfare by protecting cats from outdoor dangers and to protect wildlife uh, by reducing the number of roaming cats on the streets and their impacts on both people and wildlife. So I'd like to look more closely at the risks that cats pose to birds and wildlife um, and understand why outdoor cats are such a concern. Cats are arguably uh, the most popular pet in North America. There are an estimated eight to nine million cats in Canadian homes, um, with one in three households owning at least one cat. The good news is that an estimated 80 to 94% of pet cats are spayed and neutered, which is the most effective way at mitigating the cat overpopulation. The unfortunate news is that millions of cats are still homeless in Canada. Um, whether they were abandoned by their owners, they became lost and were unable to be uh, traced back to their owners, or were born to stray or feral cats. Now, Environment Canada estimates that between 1.4 to 4.2 million um, stray cats, uh, or of these cats, are stray and feral. Um, and local humane organizations care for these feral cat colonies, which can grow to over 200 cats um, when left unmanaged. So this is a staggering number considering that each cat can kill an average of 9 to, 26, 9 to 26 birds per year, if not more. And when cats roam outdoors, they face a number of dangers themselves to both their health and well-being. So both owned and unowned cats face life-threatening risks like car collisions, predator attacks, um, disease and starvation and the ingestion of toxins. And when cats are not spayed or neutered, um, when they're allowed to roam outdoors, they're also at risk of becoming pregnant and contributing to cat overpopulation. Um, and based on the higher rates of mortality and morbidity for outdoor cats, it's estimated that they live an average of two to five years compared to indoor cats that can live upwards of 20 years. Uh, now, free roaming owned um, and unowned cats also serve as reservoirs for um, zoonotic diseases and parasites, um, all of which can spread to humans and other wildlife. So this does pose a significant public health concern. Um, oh, sorry, I'll go back one. Um, just as an example, uh, toxoplasmosis is 
a very concerning um, disease, also known as kitty litter disease, that can be spread to humans. Uh, it's the leading cause of infectious blindness in humans and can be fatal to uh, fetuses and pregnant women um, and immunocompromised people as well. Um, and it can cause different side effects, long-term side effects, including loss of vision and hearing, uh, intellectual disabilities, and sometimes mortality. And toxoplasma uh, can also affect vulnerable wildlife populations. It's been linked to um, marine animals like the beluga whales and California sea otters um, in both mortality as well as um, just been found to be in the body in terms of infection rates, um, not necessarily linked to their death, but it has been in their systems um, after their death. So given their ability to overwhelm and prey on existing native species, cats are classified as an invasive species, um, and they are capable of causing significant destruction to the local ecology. Worldwide, cat predation is the primary threat for 38 critically endangered species, um, including the piping plover, and has caused the extinction of 63 different species. So why is conserving bird populations so important? A uh, study uh, from 2019 found that since 1970, North America has lost 2.9 billion birds, which is equivalent to a reduction of 29% of the population. Among native species facing the highest losses are American sparrows, wood war warblers, larks, and blackbirds. And BC is special, especially vulnerable to this wildlife conservation issue because we have over 300 bird species, the highest of any province, breeding uh, here. Uh, birds are also excellent indicators of environmental health and ecosystem integrity, uh, given their sensitivity to habitat loss and environmental stressors. Um, and since birds are one of the most well-monitored animal groups, um, they also foreshadow a much larger problem and can indicate similar or greater losses within the broader ecosystems. So over the last decades, a uh, few decades, uh, Birds Canada has been monitoring these population changes. And this year, they released their most updated report that shows the state of bird populations in Canada. So as you can see on the left, a significant uh, number of bird groups are in decline, unfortunately. Grassland birds, aerial insectivores, and shorebirds most especially, um, which you can see on the bottom, are at most at risk. They're sh showing the most serious declines, uh, while waterfowl, birds of prey, and wetland birds are showing an increase in their populations, thankfully due to different conservation efforts. On the right, you'll see data for forest birds, which are very commonly found in BC and contain mostly songbirds like warblers, thrushes, finches, and sparrows. And so you can see on the graph, um, forest birds appear relatively stable, but that is because there's about the same number of uh, species increasing as they are decreasing. Um, so, Predation by outdoor cats is a major threat to many birds in this group, especially when migration brings them into urban and rural areas. Um, and given that we live in a relatively urban area on the lower mainland, um, it's it's pretty common to have cats roaming around and uh, engaging with birds and other wildlife. These are some statistics from Birds Can from Bird Canada's previous report, which just shows how serious these population declines are, um, and ongoing threats of habitat loss, agricultural, 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 sorry, intensification, uh, coastal disturbance, and direct human caused mortality, all exacerbated by exacerbated by climate change, are affecting these populations as well. So to better understand the state of birds in BC, the Stewardship Centre launched the first of its kind collaborative research initiative to collect on the ground information about outdoor cats and birds in the Greater Vancouver area. These two projects were conducted simultaneously, uh, the Vancouver Cat Count and the Greater Vancouver Land Urban Land Bird Count. Those were uh, initiated in 2020. And in 2022, we expanded this research to the South Okanagan. So doing the same kind of work um, up in the interior. 
And through this research, researchers installed trail cameras throughout the city's residential, industrial, and commercial areas, um, including parks to monitor outdoor cats, as well as conduct bird counts and habitat assessments. This is uh, just a really interesting picture that we created. Um, it was collected from the Vancouver Cat Count, and it's just a collage of images collected from one trail camera um, at one location, but at different times during the day. So it just shows you how cats share spaces with urban wildlife, um, like coyotes and raccoons and skunks, and how their proximity lends to the risk of predation and disease transfer and other risks. Um, so it's just interesting to see how close they can interact. They're going through the exact same trail, um, just at different times of the day. And it kind of looks like it might be the same black cat running through there. <laughs> We're not too sure, but um, it could be. <laughs> could be one, could be a couple. So uh, through the Greater Vancouver Urban Land Bird Count, UBC PhD uh, candidate Harold Eister revisited several surveying points and transects um, established by Vancouver birders in the 60s, 70s, and 90s. And he used these spots to conduct new bird and habitat counts. And so by comparing his results to the older bird counts and examining habitat change across the city, Harold inferred the impact of habitat change on urban bird populations. And in addition to findings on what habitats to conserve, this research helped identify um, hotspots in avian abundance and suggested where cat-related mortality might be most harmful. So here is another map that shows where Harold conducted his surveys relative to very land cover. So you can see it spans across different urban landscapes as well as um, greener areas and close to shorelines. Um, he recorded the number of species of all encountered birds, vegetation and habitat, and to account for birds that might not have, he might not have seen when he was there at the site. Um, he used a special type of computer model that could include these unobserved birds. So based on his results, um, these have not yet been published, so it's a little sneak preview for all of you. Um, he found that there have been significant changes in local bird populations over the last two and a half decades. So results show that some birds have declined by more than 50%, including the violet green swallow, barn swallow, um, the house sparrow, American robin, and European starlings. Other birds have increased, including the black capped chickadees, uh, white crowned sparrow, song sparrow, and the cedar waxwing. Uh, so it's just really interesting to see, especially, you know, these huge jumps in population numbers. Um, and he has a lot more data and information that he'll be publishing on the differences in habitats and what's contributing to these population changes. And that should be published, I think, within the next few months. So stay tuned. <laughs> So uh, now that we've touched on a lot of points, I wanted to ask all of you what you think are the main sources of species decline among bird populations. So if you'd like, feel free to raise your hand and unmute yourself um, or just send your answers into the chat. Windows, absolutely, yeah. Cars, mm-hmm. What else? Those are a couple of good ones. Yeah, windows for sure. Infection, yeah, diseases, especially from cats, yes. Habitat loss. Yep. Awesome, yeah, all really great per permanent, uh, per pertinent um, issues. And food availability, yes, which also is related to habitat loss for sure. So um, the ultimate risks to biodiversity everywhere is habitat loss and climate change. Um, as these affect their migratory journeys and their nesting habits, impact their food sources, which you mentioned, and expose them to extreme weather events like storms and floods and wildfires. The destruction and de degradation of these habitats is driven by a number of factors, including um, agricultural practices, urban development, uh, natural resource extraction, and infrastructure. And the destruction of native grasslands um, in the prairies is a really 
big contributor to the loss of grassland birds, um, which is why we're seeing such a high population loss, which was shown in, in the Birds Canada report. Collisions with windows are also a huge um, uh, risk to birds. They estimate to kill more than 25 million birds in Canada every year. Uh, especially when migration brings many of these species into our urban and suburban areas where we have a lot of in infrastructure, a lot of reflective windows. Um, so millions of birds are killed annually through these collisions, um, as well as with vehicles and power lines too. And lastly, cats are the number one human-related uh, cause of mortality for birds in Canada. They kill between 100 and 350 million birds per year. Um, Using conservative estimates, two to seven percent of all birds in southern Canada are killed by cats each year. Ground nesting and ground feeding birds, young nestlings, um, and birds that are attracted to backyard feeders are the most susceptible uh, to cat predation. And unlike habitat loss, cat predation can be addressed more immediately by local actions, um, responsible pet ownership, and policy. So here you can see the comparison of cat predation to other sources of human-related mortality. Um, combined, these threats destroy an average of 2 million nests and 269 million birds per year. Now, these are just estimates, but you can just tell how staggering these numbers are. Um, other uh, causes of mortality here are like the um, agricultural practices, resource extraction, um, other sorts of human-caused impacts, um, as well as buildings and power lines. And so these two graphs show the difference in impacts between feral and domestic cats. On the left, you see the total number of outdoor free roaming cats uh, divided into feral, urban, and rural. On the right, you see the estimated number of birds killed by cats each year. And so although feral cats pose the largest threat to wildlife, as you can see on the graph on the right, domestic, urban, and rural cats are still responsible for over a third of uh, bird mortality. So we can see that there is still a really big um, area where we can improve on this. We still have some form of changing these numbers, um, trying to reduce the number of cats um, that are preying on birds as well. So for owned cats who are living in both urban and rural areas, there's a lot that we can do to prevent this. So another question for you guys, what do you think makes birds vulnerable to cat predation? There's a few different factors um, or reasons why cat uh, birds are more susceptible to cat predation and why we're seeing such high rates of mortality. Yes, brown feeding. <laughs> Apparently, yes, they are tasty. <laughs> yep. So where they feed is a huge factor. Absolutely. What else? Their nesting. Yep, their nesting habits for sure. Awesome. Yes, so all those answers for sure. Um, based on where birds feed, um, cats do like playing with things that move quickly, yes. <laughs> uh, based on where they feed, their habitat types, um, foraging behaviors, uh, all these different factors and the different species face very levels of risks. So for example, hummingbirds feed in the air, but they often use bird feeders for the, the nectar. Um, whereas larger birds are less susceptible just due to their size. Um, birds that are found in or near residential neighborhoods or farms or that frequent bird feeders, they're also more likely to be found among prey or more likely to be preyed on by cats. And uh, vulnerable species that are low nesting, ground feeding, frequent bird feeders and are found in urban areas, they're more susceptible. In BC, these species include house wrens, uh, the American robin, sparrows, cedar waxwing, uh, the house finch, and European starlings, as well as black-capped chickadees. So those are just a few examples of birds in BC that are especially susceptible um, because of these factors. 
So we've just dis discussed a ton of different issues uh, around bird and cat welfare. So I want to focus now on what on the solutions. How can we make BC a safer place for both cats and birds? Uh, all the work that we do at SCBC is done through collaborative partnerships that follow the One Health approach to addressing the free roaming cat issue. So the One Health approach acknowledges and connects the ecological, environmental, and social uh, or public health risks associated with outdoor cats and translational ecology, which was explained in the context of avian conservation by Dr. Elizabeth Gao, who we've worked with on our uh, Vancouver and Okanagan, Okanagan research initiatives. Um, this is a tool that enables us to bridge the gaps between research and implementation in animal conservation and address the issues that are presented by the One Health approach. Uh, so the principles of translational ecology allow the diversity of partners from animal welfare, wildlife conservation, um, veterinary medicine, all these different stakeholders to find common ground and work collaboratively to uh, find solutions. And in 2018, SCBC joined the Metro Vancouver uh, Birds Advisory Committee to work on solutions to this issue. Um, and in 2019, SCBC began coordinating our Cats and Birds subcommittee, um, where members met each month to collaborate on actions to address these issues. Um, and members of the subcommittee, including Nature Vancouver, consisted of representatives from all the different stakeholders that um, address this issue. Now in 2021, we also signed and created and signed a statement of collaboration um, to establish clear objectives and strategies to benefit people, cats and wildlife by preventing free roaming cats. So we had a number of different objectives that we all agreed to um, work on together. So for all the cat owners out there, um, we generally just really recommend keeping your cats happy and healthy indoors. So certain practices like permanent identification, like the micro microchip or tattoo, um, in case your cat becomes lost, spaying and neutering to prevent unwanted pregnancy, and maintaining a strictly indoor lifestyle are the best care you can give to your cats. Indoor enrichment activities like uh, toys and climbing perches, scratch posts, and window watching can still give them the interactive stimulation that they need without allowing them outdoors. Now, if a strictly indoor lifestyle isn't possible, um, there's still a few things like allowing restricted or supervised access that is safer than allowing them to free roam on their own. So minimizing the amount of time that they spend outdoors, cat proofing your fencing, building an outdoor catio, um, and leash walking, training them at a young age to walk on a leash or a harness does provide them with that outdoor enrichment that is safer for both them and wildlife. And for all of you nature and bird lovers, I'm sure these are practices are not new to you, but there's also many ways that the public um, can help protect birds as well. So keeping your feeders out of reach from cats and other predators, uh, providing fresh and nutritionally appropriate uh, food for birds, regularly cleaning and refilling food stations. Um, and another example that I was not even aware of before joining this program is drinking bird-friendly coffee. So purchasing from brands that support bird-friendly um, coffee farms um, and contribute to environmental stewardship. Those are just a few practices that can also support bird populations. Um, another um, practice is naturescaping your property. So using uh, native vegetation, um, a diverse, a diverse um, array of vegetation, so shrubs and trees that provide habitat for birds removing invasive species and creating some small bird pond or bird bath um, to keep them hydrated, creating a landscape essentially for birds that is supportive of their nesting and feeding habits it is also really important to support these um, urban and suburban uh, bird species. And of course, contributing to or participating in citizen science um, like Selena mentioned, participating in some bird counts, contributing to the data that scientists actually use to um, determine the levels of bird populations in your area. So this can mean going to your local bird count, or if you have a feeder in your back backyard or are a frequent bird watcher, logging your sightings on uh, platforms like iNaturalist or eBirds, and also spreading the word 
and incorporating what you've learned today into discussions with your friends and family. So if you know some cat owners that maybe could benefit from um, some uh, more bird-friendly cat ownership practices, uh, just helping to raise awareness with others is also super helpful. If you'd like to see your municipality take action on the roaming cat issue, um, we've also created a letter template that you can download from our website and send it to your mayor and council. And essentially, um, this is just advocating for policies and bylaws that uh, protect bird and wildlife populations by managing um, outdoor roaming cats. So with the support of their community, the council is more likely to explore the adoption of these bylaws and policies um, and base them on their local context. And finally, um, for more information, we do have lots of different resources on our website. Um, based on previous research, research, we have different tools for responsible cat ownership practices, um, research that we've done with vet professionals as well. Um, those are all available on, on our website. And finally, thank you again for um, joining me tonight and listening to me. If you have any questions that you'd like to discuss outside of today, feel free to contact me. Um, just my first name at stewardshipcenterbc.ca, or you can also take a look at our website as well. So for now, um, I'll turn it over to all of you. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Um, or if we just kind of want to have some discussions, kind of share your experiences with roaming cats and bird populations, um, I'd be happy to kind of open the floor as well. Maybe I'll stop sharing first. Thank you very much, Ariadne. So yeah, feel free to unmute yourself um, and ask questions to Ariadne. But for now, I see that Sally has shared a link to everyone. Um, Sally, do you want to talk about it? It's a Project Feeder Watch link. Actually, I'm watching with Sally. Can you hear okay. me? Okay, I'm Sally. Yes, <laughs> this is Stephen. Yeah. Well, Project Feeder Watch. I just saw Ariadne. One of your slides had the various um, iNaturalist um, and Audubon, but um, there's a really good project that runs over the winter called Project Feeder Watch, uh, where you count the birds at your feeder. Um, so it's a good citizen science project for people to join. Amazing. Okay. Thank you for sharing. Um, I'll definitely. Yeah, continue sharing that as well with other folks. Awesome. That's great, thanks. And then you, she, she put in the chat, she says, my cat owner friends do not want to keep their cats in the catio. I've never heard of this word catio. <laughs> <laughs> um, they said catio will limit cats freedom and then bring mental health issues to cats. Is it true? How can I persuade them? Yeah, so that's a really big perception that a, a lot of cat owners have. Um, they just find that allowing them to roam outdoors freely is best for their health and their mental well-being. Um, from a physical wellness perspective, I think the risks that they face when they're roaming outdoors are outweighs, um, you know, the concern of just restricting them to a uh, catio, which is a a cat patio, by the way. Um, <laughs> it's just like a small enclosure for, for cats. Um, but there's a lot of literature and, and resources out there that do support um, the benefits of catios for cats. So it's certainly better than um, just keeping them indoors, but it's still a lot better than allowing them to roam outside. Um, if you'd like to share with them some of our recent resources, we do have a brochure on our website. Um, I can send you a couple links as well to different organizations that support CADIOs too. Um, it's still providing them some level, yeah, of, of enrichment um, so they can watch the birds flying around, but not necessarily chase or jump after them. I've seen people bring their cats out just like a dog, but in a, a smaller carrier. Yes. The owners are with the cats. Yes, exactly. And that's 
another thing that you can do too. It's difficult to train cats to be leash and harness trained at when they're older. Um, but if you can get your cats to stay in a harness and leash, um, leash walk, that's another really great way of getting them outside. So they're still getting that physical activity, the outdoor enrichment, um, but they're not off running out on their own. Um, Jennifer asked, how many birds do pet dogs? That's a good question. I don't have an exact number, um, but dogs are definitely still um, at risk for birds and other wildlife. Um, you know, we know that dog owners allow their dogs to run out um, into like forests and, and areas like that. So I can definitely take a look and, and try to find out that number for you. I think it's a really good comparison to have. For sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had no idea that cats are um, such a major cause for bird mortality as well. Mm -hmm. um, Sarah says, a friend tried that cat collar to keep birds away from it, but it managed to wiggle out of it. How do you keep the collar from escaping from the cat? Mm -hmm. So that's... Um... There are, yeah, like those, uh, the bird be safe collars. So it kind of looks like a a funny clown um, clown collar. It's really colorful. So it's meant for birds to be able to see the cats really easily. Um, the one thing about those collars is that, yes, they are, they can come off really easily. And that's just because um, when cats are roaming outdoors, it can sometimes get stuck in a twig or something. And so we don't want the cats to be like stuck on a tree or strangled by their collar. So it does have to come apart um, easily enough for them to get out of that situation. Um, but then that also, you know, comes with the side effect that they're not as effective if the cat's not wearing them. So cats are very smart. Sometimes they can figure out they just got to stick a paw and kind of pull it off. Um, but when the collar is on, it is shown to um, have really good uh, benefits in terms of um, birds being able to see them and fly away before they're they're attacked. I guess it's like the opposite of camouflage, like it's making yes. the, the cats really visible. Yes, exactly. Yeah, I I don't think I've seen those before. Um, so Jan asked, are there municipalities in BC which have bylaws restricting outdoor cats? Yeah, the um the city of Richmond and the city of Surrey both have cat bylaws in place uh they don't have a bylaw that restricts cats from roaming beyond uh private property but they do have uh bylaws that's um mandate spay and neuter before um six months of age um they have mandatory identif identification so whether that's the microchip or the tattoo um they also have a bylaw that limits the number of cats per household Sometimes it's six, sometimes it's 10. And that's mainly just to target cat hoarders, which is also a really big issue and a really big contributor to cat overpopulation. Um, surprisingly, I didn't know about this before either, but yeah, it's a it's a big issue as well, especially in suburban and more rural areas. Um, on a similar thought, Sarah asked, how do we get the letter to send to City Hall regarding cat laws. Mm -hmm. I can actually uh, pull that up now and send the link into the chat. I think that would be easiest. And then it's just a Word document that you download um, and you fill in a few spaces. So like your, your name and address. Um, and then if you'd like to include any of your own experiences with Roman cats, um, you can include that as well. Let's see here. So the uh, the two presentations that I've done were to the Township of Langley and the City of Burnaby's Environment Committee. Um, so just encouraging the adoption of these kind of bylaws and, and actions on a municipal level. My project manager's also done a lot of these presentations in the Okanagan as well. So just trying to get the issue to the forefront of these local governments, trying to get the, the ball rolling in a way. So having them at least exploring the idea. Right, so Ariadne has put the link in the chat for everyone. Um, let me see where we are. Okay. 
Susan, oh, sorry, Sue Ann, for the folks who think cats need to be free, indoor cat initiative at Ohio State Veterinary, Veterinary School. Um, sorry, Sue Ann, can you elaborate a little bit more on that? Well, I put the um, I put the link in the uh, chat, and the point is is that there are some personalities, cat lovers, who think that a cat's life is not pleasant if it's indoors, and they they wish upon their cats um, a more natural life. And as already you've said. Um, Outdoor cats don't live as long as the indoor ones. And as long as you're smart about having a good life for your cat indoors, um, that's what you should do. And so some of these, uh, what uh, what would you call them? Well, they're deniers of, of something. Um, it's like some people don't want their cats spayed or neutered because it's not a natural life for them. And sometimes those people are pretty hard to convinced, but I think that the indoor cat initiative is a really good, um, you know, it's a good resource for people who may not know that indoor cats can have fun too. Thank, Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. For anyone who knows people who are on that, um, have that perspective or on kind of the fence about it. Yeah. Something like that resource would be just something, a great link to send them just so they can learn a little bit more on their own. Okay, thanks. I, I now see the I now see the link. Um Sally, she says, our feeder is regularly predated by a Cooper's hog, while our cats are indoor only. Yes, leash trained leash trained and come running when we get their harnesses out. There is plenty of tree cover, but the hawk regularly takes pickers. Yeah, I mean I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, if Cooper's hawk is a native predator or native species in BC, um, I'm not entirely sure myself, but definitely unfortunate that it's still, you know, taking the birds from your property. Um, in terms of preventing that, I mean, if they're coming to your bird feeder, maybe it's just best not to have a bird feeder or maybe one that says visible. Um, I'm not too sure unless there's other birds that are using it and they're you're not seeing that they're getting attacked by the by the hawk. Um, yeah, that's definitely unfortunate, but they are, if they're a native predator, that's also, if that's one of their native food sources, it's definitely different from a cat who is an invasive predator and they're not part of the natural ecosystem. Yushi, do you want to speak up? Put another one in here. Oh, yeah. Yushi? And oh, feel okay. free, anybody, please just go ahead and jump in. <laughs> yeah, I was with uh, work with Storage of BC in a public scenario to educate people about uh, the lunar crash stuff, but people are always be like, oh, like, I d I never seen this before, and uh, we don't think birds are that stupid. Um, so... <laughs> When we were trying to persuade people like that and try to introduce the stickers and yeah, kind of like persuade them to buy them, they were like, mm, no, it's not my stuff. I don't think we need it. So how can I persuade people like that? Um, yeah. Oh, I mean, that's awesome to hear that you've worked with SCBC in the past. That's really cool. Um, but yeah, in terms of persuading people, I think just educating them, um, as much as you can and like based on the efforts that you've already done it sounds like you're doing what you can in those cases and then it's kind of up to the the person to um you know learn a little bit more on their end and just understand the risks that birds do face and whether or not they see it themselves it doesn't mean that it's not happening in other places or to other households or at other buildings so if they're not doing it at their home it's also really important to encourage it in other places, especially more urban and industrial commercial areas as well. Um, I, at one of the events I was at in the summertime, a lady came up to me and talked about how an eagle um, crashed into one of those really big windows at the Hastings race course. And so it was stuck 
kind of like flapping around in the benches there, couldn't really find its way out, even though it was only like a three, um, I think a three wall kind of structure. Eventually they did kind of shoo it away from the windows and away from the benches. But even, you know, a big smart bird, like an eagle still was um, impacted by a window. You know, it's hard to say. So yeah, just educating people as much as we can. I did reach out to the Hastings race course to let them know and try to encourage them to um, do something about putting the stickers or some kind of reflective surface on the windows as well. I wanted to jump to Sarah's question. Um, she says, where do you buy the cat collar or the bird stickers for windows? Mm -hmm. um, the cat collar, I'll send a link here. It can be purchased through the Birds Be Safe website. Um, let me get it here. And then the stickers, there's a few different brands that do um, sell stickers. Let me see if I can pull one up as well. And for the stickers, I think that you can also use a Sharpie to like just make yes. a bunch of dots on your windows as well. Yep, absolutely. There's, um, uh, oh, what are they called? They're a, a certain kind of pen that you can use to draw on your windows, but they're washable, so you can Sharpie. remove them. Um, I'm trying to, oh, what are they called? Yeah, Sharpie, Sharpie markers, right? Yeah. Yes, and um, there's a bunch of different um, brands that sell stickers or like tape. So it's like a pre-designed or like a roll of tape you just kind of stick onto your window. If you just search bird safe stickers, um, they'll they'll come up. Yeah. And did you want to say something? I feel like you were just trying to speak, but I couldn't hear you. And no, that's me. Oh, sorry. I was just wondering. I guess I was just typing it in there. I wondered if you meant dry erase markers. Um, those, yeah, those would probably work as well. Um, a, Sharpies might be permanent, but maybe there yeah. are less permanent Sharpies. Yeah, I think so. I think they're um, gel pencils or something like that. Oh, gel pens, yeah. I think with a Sharpie, you can probably wipe it off with those um, wipes. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. You know, like those wipes that you use to clean your, um, your what do you call those? Those whiteboards? Yes. Yeah. It's like kind of alcohol spray or something. Yeah, mm -hmm. rubbing. Yeah. And Claire, you have your hand up. You have a suggestion or something? Yeah, Um. actually, just about the Sharpies in general. Um. Yeah, I think it's the oil-based white Sharpies that you can use. Like, um, I've just done a lot of bird strike projects, and that's the one that they recommend, like a very thick, the thick tip one. Um, and yeah, you just basically use rubbing alcohol, and you can remove it, and it doesn't damage the windows, and it lasts a very long time. Um, I think I picked them up at Michael's. <laughs> mm -hmm. Does yeah, it matter so that's... what color you use? Um, I don't think so, but I think the white is best um, so they can see them properly and it doesn't affect the way like if you're looking out the window like it doesn't affect the view. It's just like a cheaper version of say feather friendly. Um, yeah, it's really great. There's like a bunch of different community projects um, and you can get kids involved or whatnot. Um, and it's just really easy to do and just you just have to make sure like there is certain space. Um, um, so it's like effective. So the birds don't go like, say, in between a blank space. But yeah, yeah, super cool. <laughs> and you, she says crayon also works. <laughs> yeah. That's great. Okay, so now I'm going to go back to the comments here. I just wanted to carry on that train of thought there. Um, but thank you. So Anne, you want to speak up? Nope. nope. So Anne? Oh. Where did she then go? Okay, maybe I'll speak. I'll, I'll read it out. She goes, and cats, being predators, hunt quietly, not by chasing birds. They crouch and wait in the shade for a foraging bird to come close. A lightning strike was is very successful. Sorry, I don't know what that means. A, a lightning strike is very successful, and the sound of the bell is too late for the bird. Mm hmm. I think I, yeah, I think I see what you mean. Um, 
some by the time the cat pounces that's when the bell is ringing and they're already on the bird most likely mm. yeah so it's definitely it's not a one size fits all solution in terms of the collars and the the bells um it's just one of the ways that if your cat is roaming outdoors at least having some kind of um preventative measure is helpful than none and ideally keeping them indoors or supervised is also the best best way and our bird expert bill kincaid he says back to the early discussion about cooper's hawk he said cooper's hawk is a native species and small birds are their natural prey so it's just nature at work yeah thanks bill okay um, my son actually had an interesting question. He says, we've kept birds and cats as pets for the longest time. Do you know which one started first, like in history? That's a really interesting question. Um, in terms of domestic pets, I would say probably cats. Um, birds, I think, have been used as uh for like hunting so the larger predatory birds um keeping them as hunting animals um and then were eventually domesticated looking for the more exotic pets as and keeping them as as indoor pets um i would have to look that up to know exactly when that where that timeline is but i know that cats are relatively um became domesticated relatively later than dogs especially. So dogs have been a domestic pet for a lot longer than cats were. But in terms of, yeah, keeping the birds and the birds and the cats separate, um, that's an, that would be an interesting household to have both. But I think at a young age, cats can <laughs> learn to live with, uh, with a small bird. Okay. Well, that's, that's the end of the text that I've seen come in. Um, if you have any other questions, feel, please feel free to put it in or just unmute yourself and, and say it. Well, hi, sorry to interrupt. Um, my name is Yushi and last time when I was working with um, Storage APC, um, uh, staff introduce a kind of sticker that uh, can prevent bird collision, but it's like I forgot it's specific like brand or what kind of the of species uh, sticker work the best. So if you have a link, could you please paste it here? And yeah. also she recommends something like uh, I don't remember clearly, but she said something like if we use dark crayon or dark mark pen inside a window and dark decorate the inside of window, it doesn't work. We should use some light color pen to decorate the outside of the window. That's what I remember. So I'm just wondering if I, I remember something correct. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's might of what Claire, what Claire was alluding to using the white Sharpie, I think works best. So it's a brighter color, more likely more easier um, for birds to see, uh, maybe a bit more reflective of light and everything. So um, I think sticking to a white color and in terms of the window stickers, let me um, quickly try and pull up the brand that we recommend. Um, let's see. Uh, Feather Friendly, I think is the one that we um, recommend on our website. Let me put the link in here. Um, and I know at our outreach events, actually, we have some kind of like demonstration products that have um, just show kind of like you have a piece of plastic and it has the stickers already on it. So um, we have those when we're out in public kind of demonstrating to people what these stickers could look like. Um, so there's ones that are, you know, more for industrial commercial buildings, but I think they're also useful for um, properties, home and households. How far should those dots be? Sorry, what was that, Selena? How far apart should those dots be? Um, I think it's it comes with instructions um, in the packaging. It might say on the website, but uh, there's some window treatments that come kind of already spaced out a bit. So you just kind of stick them out 
uh, stick them onto the window how they come in the packaging. Great. If there are no more questions, I wanted to say thank you to Ariadne. I learned a lot. I had no idea that cats are such a big cause for bird mortality. And um, there's something that we can all do, like keep the, keep the cats indoors and also apply some bird stickers to our windows. About two inches by two inches apart. Thanks, Claire. Amazing. Well, thank you everyone so much. And thank you for the awesome discussions and questions um, and introducing yourselves and turning on your cameras. It's really awesome to see all of you. So thank you. I really appreciate it. And again, if you have any other questions or things you want to pass along, just shoot me an email.